Okay, so in this session, we're going to be talking about open pedagogy. And we should probably start by defining it. And a simplest definition is that students create rather than consume academic content. Uh, they're consuming part of it, of course, while they're doing that, but students have a bit more autonomy and are a bit more actively engaged with the content. Um, and typically, well, in open pedagogy projects, the, the work they create is shared. Sometimes it's only shared within the class, but it's often shared more broadly to a wider audience, um, often, you know, on a public site of some form. And we'll, we'll talk about ways of doing this in more details. Um, but it, it also is a form of active learning because the students are actively engaged with the content rather than just listening to a lecture or just reading or just writing papers and you know, exams and so on. <clears throat> and one of the things that works really nicely about open pedagogy is to use the term uh, by um, the founder of Lumen Learning. Um, I can't think of it, uh, I, I know it, but in any case, um, the, the assignments that students do are non-disposable. So many assignments that students do in our classes are they, they, they do some work on their own, maybe in a group, they upload it into the learning management system, and then at the end of the term, if they haven't kept a copy of it, they lose access to it. The nice thing about open pedagogy projects, especially when they're posted publicly, is that students have them later on, and that's something they really value. Um, some of my students noted that they really appreciated the fact that the work that they were doing would, could be shared with their parents, could be shared with their friends. You know, it, it, um, one person said that uh, he really appreciated the fact that he could show his parents what he had been doing here all this time. Um, and that's something that students tend to intrinsically value. And also students, if they have really good projects, can put them on the LinkedIn profiles and show up and so forth and share them if they're applying to grad school or share them with potential employers. Um, and that can be really useful. Um, it also often involves a service learning component because they're creating something that can be used by other people in the future. Some examples. Um, we'll go over these in much more detail shortly, and I'm going to share a resource that has a lot of examples on it. Um, students, one of the simplest ways of doing open pedag pedagogy projects is to annotate online content. For example, using Hypothesis or some other annotation tool where students can go out and place their own annotations on documents. Um, in a more extreme form of this, you could annotate documents and then if they're open source, if they're, um, if they're either public domain or if they're under a Creative Commons license, they can annotate it and create textbooks and such things. One of the most one of the things that really spurred much of the interest in open pedagogy was a project that uh, Robin DeRosa did a number of years back where she was looking at the cost of textbooks and concern because many of the students at Plano State where she teaches were low income. And she was looking at the cost of the Norton anthology she had been using. And she noted that pretty much all of the items in the Norton anthologies of literature that she was working with, um, I think it was a, early American literature or something similar, all those things were in the public domain and yet students were paying quite a bit for these bound volumes of those public domain of works that were in the public domain. So her first open pedagogy project was to have her students take the, find the documents and annotate them and create their own textbook basically, which could be used by future classes. And then um, one of the things she noted is she thought that each year students would build on it, but she found each year when she did a new project, students wanted to do something new and different. They didn't wanna take the work of other students, but it still allowed them to do something productive where you know the main benefit of those Norton anthologies were the annotations of footnotes and so forth. And basically that's what she had her students do as the major task. Um, so they were creating something that could be used by other people. And then other people in a department took, I think it was in her department, or perhaps another institution, took that and changed the framing a little bit and added some new materials that had a bit of a women's studies focus, if I remember correctly. But that's one thing, one relatively 
well, just annotation is a relatively easy thing to do. Book projects could work in some disciplines. Um, you could also have students create blogs. Um, a number of Gardner Campbell has been doing this all oh, since he was back at the University of um, Mary Washington, where they first did the domain of your own project, where every student had their own domain, which they could take with them after they graduated. But up until that point, the institution was paying for their own server. And he's been using blogs for quite a few years where students blog about their learning journey. So they're doing reflections on what they're doing as they're learning new material. And again, they're sharing those publicly. Wiki projects are another one. Uh, the first time I, I did, I haven't done this in a while, but uh, we had someone leave in my department and I was a department chair and we had no one else at the time who could teach history of economic thought. And so I decided to do it. And again, I was looking at the cost of textbooks, which even though this was like 10, 12 years ago, um, they were pretty expensive. They were $150, $180 or so. At the time, that was quite a bit, but now that's probably a bit more typical. But what I did instead is I gave students the original source or links to the original source materials. And I had them create um, three posts in the first half of the semester and three posts on the second half, basically summarizing the work of individual economists or individual schools of, of economists. And one of the things I told them was that I will ask some of my friends who are historians of economic thought to look at their work and to comment on it and so forth. And they appreciated the fact that they were creating something that other people could look at. Um, that's disappeared. It was on a wiki platform that no longer exists, but, um, but it was something that worked pretty nicely. Um, and certainly they had much more active engagement than when they were just writing papers that only I saw or something similar, uh, because they also gave presentations on that in class after they created um, their materials. <clears throat> Glossaries are another one. We had a couple of projects here. Uh, someone in the P department um, had students create a glossary for Shakespeare I don't remember. It may have been Shakespeare sonnets or Shakespeare plays or whatever. But in any case, a lot of the words and terms that are used in phrases are somewhat archaic that students don't necessarily know. Um, so they created a glossary that could be shared publicly so that other students in other classes might benefit from that. Um, <clears throat> podcast projects are getting more and more common. Um, Vanderbilt University had a big podcast project a number of years ago under Derek Bruff, where various classes had their own podcasts, and then each class picked their best podcast, and there was a bit of a competition across the institution to see which class podcasts were the best, and they made it into the Vandivox podcast. So students were essentially creating these podcasts in individual disciplines, sharing them publicly, and again, the institution had this other series. I'm not sure if that's continuing because Derek Bruff um, left there about a year and a half ago. Uh, he's now at University of Mississippi, at least for now. Um, I've done this in, in several of my classes and students find it pretty interesting. They're often intimidated a little bit at first um, because they say, well, I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to edit audio. I don't know how to record audio. I don't know if I have the equipment needed to do this. So, you know, I gave them a simple assignment where they just listen to a short podcast. I gave them a number of economic, pod I teach economics, I gave them links to a number of economic podcast series, most of which were between all oh, seven and 15 minutes. And I asked them to listen to one and just record their voice responding to it and sharing that in a Dropbox, uh, well, a, a course of Dropbox. Um, and, you know, they became much more comfortable with it. Once they saw they could record it, save it as a file and then upload it, they became much less anxious. Um, Videos uh, are another type of project students can do. A common type of open pedagogy project is for students in a college class, to particularly introductory classes, to create videos that could be used by high school students in those disciplines. Um, I know there was a chemistry class a couple of years ago. I forgot where. I, I, well, I do have links to many of these things, so I'll share those in, in just a little bit. Um, but when students create videos explaining something to someone else, they often learn it much more deeply than if they're just trying to study it. Um, it, it 
it seemed like there's more intrinsic value in it. And again, what I think most of us have found is that once we, we, we did well in our undergraduate courses and so forth, but we really didn't always understand it quite as deeply as after the first time we've taught it. Because when you have to come up with a way of explaining things so that novices can understand it, it forces you to think about it a bit more deeply and so forth. And those video projects could be a lot of fun and students generally enjoy them. Um, you could have students share research projects. Um, I teach econ one of my the classes I teach is econometrics, which is basically using statistical analysis in economics. And um, one of the things I found is that there are quite a few institutions out there where they publish student research. I know that partly because I've gotten submissions of some of those from time to time. So there is a downside that sometimes people will just plagiarize those things, um, you know, but you know, reminding people that once things are, one of the nice things about open pedagogy projects though, is that if you publish these things um, publicly, you can remind students that if someone else finds that you're reproducing their work online, you know, then it would be, there's some chance you're going to be caught on this if your instructor doesn't catch you on that. Um, and you can all, generally these projects are scaffolded from beginning to end. So, you know, I, in some, in most of the open pedagogy projects I do, um, I've had students, I tell students, I've used most recently book projects and podcast projects. And one of the things I, I do is I first have students come up with an idea for what they're going to be working on on, the, on a podcast, or as the class as a whole decides what they want to do for a book project, they break up into groups and they first submit an outline of the chapter or the arguments. And then they submit a bibliography and then an annotated bibliography. And then they do a, a an outline and then a rough draft and then you know multiple rough drafts often before we get to the final project and that also tends to discourage issues of academic you know academic integrity violations although with ai tools that may be more of a challenge this year we'll see um, i did see a bit of that last time and i did encourage students actually to use it to do some polishing on the drafts but i wanted them to do the actual structuring and the actual you know do the actual writing themselves. And I I only had really one case the last time I did this in the um, spring semester, but it may be more challenging now as the use of these tools have become much more ubiquitous. You know, in the spring of last year, it was still a bit new for students, but, um, and the tools have improved quite a bit. So we'll see what happens. But um, the reasons why I use it, and these were all arguments that I saw Robin Rosa, uh, DeRosa present, um, student motivation, that when students are doing these things, they often find the projects fun. They're different from the other term paper projects or other writing projects or the tests that they take in so many other classes. Um, as again, there's that issue of non-disposable assignments. They're creating something that's going to persist beyond the end of the term. That public audience is something they value. Just, this, these were things we already talked about. Like I, I should have cleaned those slides up. Sorry about that. But it is a form of active learning. And there's quite a bit of evidence suggesting that active learning results in better long-term recall and more ability to transfer, con taking the concept you learned in one application and applying them in other applications. Um, you know, if you if when thinking about an open pedagogy project, one of the most important things to do is make sure you're not doing it just for the sake of doing it, because I have seen some cases like that. Um, you know, make sure that whatever you're doing aligns to what you want the students to learn in the course. Um, there's an issue that potentially may come up. I haven't actually experienced this. Um, or at least not in any great extent, that some students may not want their work to be published publicly. And there's a few things, a few ways around that. One is you could give students an alternative assignment so that they don't have to share the work. The other is you could have students post their work anonymously or publish it under a pseudonym if, they're, if it's going to be publicly available. Um, when I've done podcast projects, I do those in, in some lower level classes. I give students the option of either sharing them only with a class or sharing them on a podcast server. So, you know, they, they do have the option of keeping it local or sharing it more broadly. And it's about 50-50 on that. 
um, you know, when students are, if you're going to have students work in group and groups, and that's generally how most of these projects work, simply because the projects are a bit more complex and because there's all these stages involved where you're providing feedback, you know, some degree of group work is useful, but make sure that students, when they start working on the project, this is true for projects and group work on projects anyway, have students come up with a collaboration plan where they talk about when they're going to meet, how they're going to meet, how they're going to organize a task, how they're going to divide it, and also how they're going to resolve disputes and so forth. So that sort of thing can be really helpful. Um, and one of the things I've been doing more and more is periodically in class, if it's a face-to-face -face class, I allow some time in class where they'll actually do a little bit of group processing. Hi, Kathleen, uh, where they'll talk about, you know, how the project is going and, and also whether some people in the group may not be doing what the others expect them to be doing. And just having those some time, it doesn't have to be long, it could be 10 or 15 minutes in the class, having some time to process how things are going in the group and working on ways of resolving those issues reduces the number of issues where you're called to mediate problems. Because when I did group projects before, they weren't always quite as well structured or quite as formally structured. And um, there were always cases where students would come to me and say, this person in the group is not pulling their weight and so forth. And, you know, that's always a potential, but, um, but having that processing can really help a bit. Uh, and Kathleen mentions that taking the, our temperature, just checking on how things are going. And it, you know, it's better to do that than to let resentment and animosity build up because then the group tends to shut down and tends to be much less effective. Um, and you, know, you should always have an out for the students who just disappear or a way of addressing that. Um, and, you know, when I, when I have a large class, and some of my classes are relatively large, there may be one or two students who just starts ghosting the class. You can try to bring them back in, pull them in, but that doesn't always work. Um, and to make the process easier and also more effective, it helps if you set up a, a plan, not just for you giving feedback for the students, but for peer feedback. One of the things I've been doing quite a bit is using hypothesis in class where students will write up things if they're doing a, well, when I've had them do book projects, um, I have them submit drafts in Google Drive where they're all jointly editing. And also, so I can monitor the work of different students in the groups. I ask them to use different color um, so that each person has a unique color. They put it at the top of the document and it gives me a nice visual representation of what contributions were made by each student. And what at various points in the process, I'll freeze that. I'll say, as of midnight tonight or 5 p.m. tomorrow, um, we're going to take all the documents and then we're going to share them. And basically, I just download them from Google Drive, save them as a PDF, upload them, and then I have students annotate them in Hypothesis. Um, and that sort of feed, peer feedback has been really helpful because Often when students hear things from their peers that something isn't that clear or that perhaps they could clean up their grammar a little bit or something, it takes a lot of some, a lot of pressure off of me. And also I found that students tend to be fairly responsive to their peers uh, in terms of, you know, when peers are telling them they haven't done something as well as perhaps they could, um, they often take that much more seriously and make more and do a better job of correcting it than when I just provide them the feedback. And that can be really helpful. And again, it, much of the feedback that students give is feedback that I would give anyway. Um, but that has worked really nicely. And I rotate it. So if there's you know, seven or eight groups in the class or nine groups, um, each group will provide peer feedback to three other groups or something like that. And that'll rotate through the term. So, Everyone is getting feedback from everyone else at different stages. Um, you know, one of the issues is that students aren't always that aware of copyright issues and, you know, reminding them of issues of copyright and intellectual integrity. Um, you know, they've often been, you know, they've often just copied and pasted things, even when I have them as seniors and reminding them that, you know, the work they have to properly cite something. Um, and that usually has worked pretty well. Um, and sometimes students will say, do you have a citation for this? Where, where is this argument coming from? Um, and that, 
Well, just reminding him of this is helpful. And actually, I've seen far less issues with intellectual integrity when I've been doing open pedagogy projects than in classes where students were working on their own and just submitting papers or something or research projects or something similar. Um, now, one other thing is if you're going to um, have a public, if you're going to share work publicly, it it it's important that you find some way of hosting that in a way that's not going to be terribly important. I haven't had them cite use of AI because I, I haven't done this really um, since last spring. Well, last spring, I did have podcast projects, but in there, that wasn't really that much of an issue that they were pretty much creating their own work as they went. And, it, you know, the project was scaffolded and it, there really seemed to be little evidence of the use of AI in that class. I've had it in other issues, um, but yes, I will tell them to cite the use of AI. Um, and we'll see, I still have to work that out. And I'll, one of the things I do, the class where I've used this the most is a capstone class where the syllabus is actually co-created in the first day of class. I'll ask them what type of projects they might like to do. I get, try to get a consensus on that. Um, and then they also select the topics for the readings. It's a capstone course, which pulls together all the work they've done in the major. And so we come up with a mix of topics that we'll be addressing through the semester, in addition to the project that they're working on. Um, and so one of the things we'll certainly be talking about is the appropriate use of AI as we move through. Um, but in terms of hosting this, it's really good if you can find a way of hosting it in a way that's not going to be costly so that it's going to exist beyond that. Um, for example, uh, Oswego was one of the campuses involved in the um, SUNY CREATE project. In fact, we were, we were co-principal um, investigators on the original project that provided IITG funding for that. And we've had a lot of students, well, students have been using this in a number of classes, but the projects I've worked on with students, I haven't hosted there in large part because I was worried that at some point we, when it shifted to campus funding, we might lose that. And in fact, we are losing it at the end of the semester because our campus isn't willing to come up with the $1,500 to maintain that server space. Um, so um, I, I've either bought my own server space and, you know, you can get server space from Reclaim Hosting or other places for $25 a year for enough for many open pedagogy projects. Um, or, you know, if you have students create videos, YouTube is free, for example. Um, so, but you want it to be something that's going to be sustainable and that won't take too much work. Um, we already, I already talked a little bit about evaluating individual contributions. You have to make sure that the students are responsible uh, for their own, for some share of the work. And you want to not just look at the group project, but also um, you, you need to have some type of individual accountability because some students will not do as much work if you can't somehow keep them accountable. Um, the other issue, and this is one that students are not generally have not generally been exposed to very much is the issue of accessibility, that we wanna make sure anything that's posted publicly is in an accessible format. So having transcripts with podcasts or videos um, is important, for example. If they're going to include images, they need to have alt tags, and et cetera. Uh, and also providing structure that if they're creating documents, having them, um, having them put in heading, the heading structures and titles and so on. Um, and that's a useful skill for them to learn anyway, because there's a good chance in many positions I'll need to do that in the future. Um, and then when you share their work, you have to determine, well, I have the students determine what type of licensing they want to use. Um, most commonly they use the, well, in all the book projects my students have done, they've used a CC BY, uh, accredited, the certification or yeah, licensing. Um, and, um, and that basically lets anyone use their work. And, you know, um, there's a number, you know, there's a number of other licensing thing. There's the, uh, the share alike so that it can only be used in other documents that are shared under the same type of license. Um, there's the um, CC by no derivatives uh, where 
where anyone who you anyone is free to use a work, but it can't be modified. That's most commonly used with things like images or poems or other things, so that you know people can't take their work and add things to it. They have to use it in its present in its existing form. Um, they there's a non-commercial restriction, which I always thought students might be might want to impose, but my class was never concerned. On the other hand. I don't think there's a lot of commercial gain potential from most of the work that they're creating. I don't think, you know, someone's going to go and create a movie about their book projects or whatever. Um, and, um, and you can combine them in various ways. But so far, every time I've shared these licensing things with students, they've all been unanimous in, in uh, preferring just letting anyone use it however they want, um, et cetera. Okay. And, you know, there's a link to the licenses, but, you know, I... so um, one thing, there is a student release form, and I probably should use this. I never have, but this is actually a Creative Commons um, attribution form where you can have students release the rights to the work to basically state that they agree with sharing it. I've been perhaps too informal with that, but but it's it's not a bad idea that if students are going to be in a video, if they're going if you're going to share the work, having some type of a release agreement is probably a good thing. And I'll share these slides and so forth um, later if you want to look at that. Um, so, um, anyone here have any ideas for open pedagogy projects? Actually, Kathleen mentioned using infographic projects last term uh, where there was a planner template where they documented who did what in their plan, which is a good way of getting at uh, attribution. Um, in, that project, in that project, John, our goal was to create um, instructional like tidbits for other students and for faculty okay. on using certain tools. And so, um, some of the stuff was more um, education focused, but some of it was just utilitarian. And we and we chose to do it. I, of course, I, what I was going to start out with is try to simplify because it will all get so complicated. <laughs> so we did both um, uh, collaborative infographics, um, mm -hmm. and through that process and and planning all the way along, and a uh, Pichu Kucha. And I always say it that way, probably the wrong way, but uh, to present to class using their infographic. Um, so they were using multiple tools. I, I asked them to all publish in Canva because accessibility was much easier than um, other some other tools. And I wanted them to be able to own it um, after the project. Our campus doesn't license hardly anything um, that our students need to use. And they're all gonna be teachers and they're gonna be taking stuff along with them, I hope. So um, so that was an interesting blend. And that was one of those SUNY, um, that was sponsored by one of the the SUNY, what was it, what was it called? The IITG so, grant? No. Um, no. Um, oh, the SUNY Create? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that was one of our, our campus's efforts. So, and, and um, and we did, we use Google Docs as the, you know, sandbox for everything before yeah. they move into the design phase, so. Google Docs is just such a great format for collaborative work for students. They can work on it synchronously, asynchronously, you know, either in person or remotely, and it just works really nicely. Um, we used Google Docs many years ago when um, we built a, an, um, an app um, <laughs> for hot spots on campus and what we with freshmen. So what they had to do was um, come up with a descriptor that would make sense to another freshman, go get some, you know, write it, write it as a blurb, like an info blurb. And that went into Google My Maps. And because our campus will not allow access to Google My Maps, <laughs> I used my personal account and then had navigators from the class plot their own um, thing, you know, their own place, campus place onto the map. Um, 
and then I dropped then I dropped it into I forget what we were using then but and uh, some app builder so they could go around with their phone and instead of doing Pokemon they were they were supposed to find places you know that were hot spots and test it and we had a blizzard that day so it was really fun out testing it but that again these are all such these my only thing is as fun as the outcome finally is the effort to get there and the layers to get there sometimes become immense elephants in the room for the students who don't know what the end looks like and they're not quite sure why are we working so hard on this thing you know the scaffolding pieces so my own goal is to try to simplify when I'm doing these open pedagogy projects. So any advice you have would be wonderful. Well, one thing is that if you're doing a project that was done before, sharing the personal, the, the previous iterations can be really helpful. Um, and one of the things I did the first time I did this was I recorded a podcast with some of the students in the class and I shared that with them before the start of the semester to see if they'd be interested in doing something similarly. And that was really helpful because they got really, <clears throat> sorry, they got really excited about it when they heard how enthused the previous year's class was. Um, so, but yes. Yeah, Explaining it, why you're doing it, and why they need to do these steps is really important because it can seem tedious when they're just going through hoops and they're not fully understanding why it's necessary to get to the end goal. So, any any other thoughts on possible projects you might like to try? I'm asking partly because we're going to look at some resources and we can focus on any that might be of interest, or we could just go through the whole set. Well. I know from from my perspective in teaching engineering classes out at UB at uh, University of Buffalo. Um, I like this as a way to sort of get at the way of thinking because really right that's the, the key. Um, and I'm thinking towards is there a way to instead of just I'll say just just isn't quite the right word. Um, textual annotation more of a diagrammatic annotation. Right, because in teaching engineering and thinking something like a pendulum, it's what are, how are the forces acting on it and what directions are they acting on it? And having students sort of provide um, provide insight and in, in that is a tough thing to diagnose where misconceptions are, are forming without understanding that. And then the other thing in the resources, I'm gonna, I'm gonna mute myself in a second because I'm, Oh, I'm in an office, sort of. Um, is uh, any resources for internationalization or working with students from different backgrounds would be helpful because I tried, um, I don't know if you're familiar with POGL, the Process Oriented Guided Inquiry Learning. Yes. Um, I tried that in, an, in a graduate level optimization class and many of my international students come from a different tradition of education where it's more repetitive and instruction and they did not understand why they were taking ownership of the learning activity and so it was fighting through that and most of the time was spent on no just tell me what i need to know um yeah yeah it it is different and that sort of cross-cultural thing can be challenging. Um, I've had some of the same issues with, with some students from Asia who just who were a bit uncomfortable with this at first because they were just coming in. They were Korean students and they were not used to being a bit more actively engaged in these types of projects. They got past it, but it did require you know, some discussions about what the research shows about the benefits of active learning and so on. And, um, and they ended up doing really well. Uh, one thing that actually, some, we talked to someone who uh, does an orientation program for Chinese students at the uh, University of Miami every year. And one of the things that he noted was that Students there were really good at presenting material, but they tended not to participate very actively in class. So when you give them a project where they have to present, um, it can be 
they're more comfortable with that. And I'm not quite sure why, what, where the difference comes in there. Um, but um, actually this summer I was teaching at Duke where I had a couple, um, I had four students from China and, um, and they were really quiet. It was really hard to draw them out in class, but they gave a presentation at the end of the class that was just amazing. They had spent, I suspect they had probably given up a lot of sleep <laughs> in order to do it, but there was all sorts of humor in it. They had imagery in there that was just remarkable. It was easily, in one case, um, in one group that was clearly the best presentation in class. And, you know, I knew they were going to do well because they did well with all their assignments. They were just so quiet and seeing them presenting and putting in jokes and humor into their presentation really kind of shocked me a little bit because it was so different than their day-to-day -day participation. Um, I don't, I don't have a lot of resources here. Mine were more strictly related to various products, um, project examples, but um, anyone else have some thoughts on that? You know, the only thing I can think of is, you know, the more you can sell the process and explain to students why you're doing it, you know, Marianne Winklemiss's uh, transparency and learning and teaching approach, the TILT approach, the more you can convince students or explain to students the benefits of what they're doing, the more likely they'll buy in. But it sometimes is a bit of an adjustment process. Um, I know when I, I use a flipped classroom in my large intro class, and you know the most common comments I get from students every year is that um, you're making us learn this ourselves, you know. And and my response, I I'll bring that up to them and I'll say, you know, in class, and I'll say, you know, I can't do the learning for you. But when you're actively engaged with this material, you're going to learn more. It's not always going to feel as good because you get to see more immediately where you have some gaps in your learning. But that's actually an important part of the learning process that, you know, this is not just a body of knowledge where you have to absorb things. You know, you're going to make mistakes on the way. And, and learning how to learn from those mistakes is really helpful. Um, there was a study at Harvard about three years ago where they surveyed students at, uh, in terms of in particular classes where active learning was used and then a control group in STEM fields where active learning was not used. And what they found was that students in the classes where it was primarily lecturing with, with little or no active learning activities, those students thought that the lectures were more effective, they thought they learned more and so forth. But when they were given the same exams, they didn't do quite as well. So um, active learning results in more learning, but it doesn't always feel that way. And it's, it's an adjustment and it's large, well, and part of the issue is that most students haven't been exposed to a lot of that in their K through 12 or in their other college classes. So um, that pushback is a challenge. You know, when you have tenure, it's not as much of an issue, but it is something I warn, um, you know, junior faculty about that if they're going to do something that's very different from other uh, what other faculty are doing, they really need to sell it well to students or it can affect their evaluations. And in some departments, you know, the, the people reviewing them may not be aware of the research on active learning. And that can be a bit of a challenge for a faculty. So, um, you know, when I was doing mostly lecturing when I started, my evaluations are usually number one or two in the department. When I started doing much more active learning, they fell way down. But um, we also, in, up until uh, up until COVID, pretty much, we were doing a lot of assessment in our classes, and those instructors who were using active learning approaches in our intro classes had students that scored some significantly higher on standardized tests of student understanding. We embedded those questions on the final exams and um, it, was, it was a pretty dramatic gain from that. So, um, and it has helped that pretty much everyone else in the department is doing that too. So it's no longer just a few of us standing out. Um, any other suggestions on how to address um, that sort of um, pushback or, you know, just tell me what I need to learn and memorize. And, um, it's something I struggle with all the time myself too, but um, not just with international students, but with domestic students too. So, oh well, um, let's, um, 
let's look at some of the things out there. If you want to, if you hold up your phone to this, or if you just go to openobjectives.org, this is something that Judy Littlejohn and I put together for a presentation at CIT a few years ago, um, and also um, at a presentation for the Online Learning Consortium uh, a few years back. And I haven't updated in about a year or so, but I think much of the stuff in here is is well the stuff that's there is pretty good uh well we've got quite a few resources but let's hop over to that um huh it i must have closed that okay so i'm going to open it myself right from here um and if we go to open pedagogy here and open pedagogy resources so we go um What we, what we did here is we put together some examples of some of the more common open pedagogy projects. So for example, if you wanna pick blogs, you know, here's some examples of the use of them in various disciplines. And then um, we can close that. And then here are some resources we put together. Well, one is a podcast uh, for someone from Cortland talking about her use of, um, of blogs. Um, oh, you know, there's also, we did another one with um, Gordon Campbell. I, I should include that too. But in any case, uh, here's some examples of using blogs. Um, and similarly, you know, another common type of open pedagogy project is to have students do some collation or some sort of a collection uh, that's often done using, um, using, what is that tool? Uh, it's, it's using collections. It's, um, Sorry, I, I haven't been getting much sleep um, with these workshops and the videos and everything else I've, I'm behind. But uh, in any case, um, I've, I'll think of it later. Um, there are some really nice tools out there that you can use to, to post and they're open source tools, as long as you have a server to put them on where you can tag materials and link them and put descriptions and so forth. Um, and um, Here's, here's some really good ones. Uh, this is a fashion history timeline at the Fashion Institute of Technology as a collection of resources. Um, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Is this active? Okay, here we go. Um, this tells you what's being used. It's a little plugin. Um, and this is not the... This is not what I thought. This is just a WordPress site, basically. Okay, never mind. But if you're if you see something really cool online, by the way, if you put in Wep Wepalizer, it will tell you what the software tools is that's generating the displays, and that's kind of nice. But here, for example, uh, you can pick a time period. You can pick the ancient world. And they add to this every year, the classes that do this. So let's say we want to look at Assyrian fashion, for example. Um, this will give you some images from that and some, well, there's not a lot. That's, that might be something that, um, well, it looks like they didn't quite get too far on that. Um, but let's say 16th century, there we go, 1550 to 1559. Here are some images of clothing, there's some description and so forth. And that's, it's, it's an interesting project where students are creating something that they know is going to be out there beyond them and that they can share links to it as something that they put together. Um, and there's also essays on artwork, garment analysis, and so forth. Um, and um, so this is a resource, you know, if you create a resource like this, you can keep expanding it and building on it all the time. Um, Uh, Kathleen mentions that um, having students see these things in the real world, showing what they can do is really helpful. Um, when you did podcasts a, a few years ago, they weren't that common, but now <laughs> it seems like almost everyone has a podcast. Um, so um, yeah, so there's, there's some really, well, this is a really nice resource again, but you can do this in anything. You can do this with history. You can do all sorts of archives. Um, you can do it in architecture. I'm not quite sure, maybe in engineering, <laughs> there may be some applications where you can you know, gather things. There's the Baltimore Uprising Archive Project, which was something they did in real time um, to capture that uh, 2015 uprising there. Um, 
and there's, you know, there's accounts of it. There's oral recordings of people who were there. There's photos, videos, uh, produced recordings, written accounts, email archives, and so forth. Um, so oral histories would be another nice, nice type of thing you could do, uh, or documenting particular events uh, could be interesting. Um, the Appalachian Oral History Project interviews from 1965 to 89 is another similar series where students were going out and recording these things and then putting them on the, online, tagging them and so forth. Um, E-portfolios is another nice thing to do. In general, when students create e-portfolios, they can share their work and so, well, here's some samples from, I thought we had more, <laughs> sorry. Um, and here's some resources, well, Word, WordPress guide to that. Um, online student, well, podcasts. I mentioned the, well, there's one that my students were doing, the Bandy Box one is pretty impressive though. Um, that's been going on for a few years. And I'm hoping it's still going on. It was something that Derek Ruff had put together. Uh, I did not mean to change the language. Um, uh, that was not what I expected to see there. Um, I'm wondering if perhaps that may, okay. It looks like someone bought the domain and that has disappeared with Derek Ruff's uh, departure. It was still there a few months ago, but uh, here's one that Rebecca Mushter did along with people in other departments with Voices of Us We Go Veterans. It was a collaborative project between students. Okay, I should have checked this last night. It was there. It was there a couple of months ago. Apparently that student may have graduated and their, their address has gone. I'll have to get that updated. Okay, um, Student book projects, for example. Here's Robin DeRose's work that I mentioned before. Here's one from my 2019 class. I've got others too, but um, this was actually a pretty decent one. Um, and this was all done in press books. Um, at the time, press books, you just paid a license fee for, and it was um, easy to do. Yeah, the Wayback Machine would have been a good fallback. Um, but I'm pretty sure that still went on because that, that, as we go veterans involve people in a writing class in a graphic design a web class and a photography class so they took photos of the people they had interviews with them and they had other materials there um but yeah this was uh there were 27 students in it and they worked in groups of three on you know three people per chapter and um and there was an interview with them and if we go to the contents um, these were the chat, well, these were the sections of the book. So for example, um, here's causal factors. You know, there were um, well, the role of discrimination or rising skill premium. Um, it, these were the three students. They got their name right up at the top. They can link to that. And that was something they really appreciated. Um, and um, Going down, um, oh, Jessica Kruger at the University of Buffalo has done this where she had um, 75 students create a book that basically she looked at textbooks for a course and she noted there were three books out there that contained the material that each of which contained some but not all the material she wanted to address and they all cost two or three hundred dollars each and she didn't think it was reasonable to ask students to spend eight hundred to a thousand dollars for three textbooks so she had them create their own and basically they broke up into small groups and each of them had to deliver the chapter a week or so before it was discussed in class and again there was a scaffolding process going on with that but it was really interesting when they did that um what weight in the grade book do these projects carry that depends on the class when i've used it in the capstone class it's probably like 30 or 40 maybe 50 percent of the class because it is something to work on all the way from the beginning to the end um, when i do a podcast project in my introductory class it's generally about 20% or 25%. Um, and they do two podcasts, one in the first half of the term and one in the second half, where they have to basically find examples in the world out there of the topics they've been learning about it and talk about how what they've learned can be used to explain what they're observing. And some of those have been quite good. Um, there's some other good open pedagogy resources. There was a SUNY Fact 2 group on this about three years ago, I think it was. And here's a twine thing, linking to other examples 
in SUNY and I think some outside of it. Um, this is the open pedagogy notebook put together by Roman de Rosa and I don't remember his name, but he goes by th that psychology professor or that psych professor on Twitter or X. Um, and here's some other examples from Austin. Um, Ed Beck has at, um, at Oneonta has a lot of good examples. Here's a discussion of the SUNY Create. Uh, here's some other SUNY open pedagogy projects. Um, the SUNY OER community course series has some materials on open pedagogy. And OER services has some resources on this. And SUNY, at least at the time, has a master class in open pedagogy. And I should have realized that has gone too. Okay, uh, I will have to update this site. <laughs> it was um, I, probably been a year since I updated. And the links were all active at the time, I believe. But Ed does have a number of good projects out there, as long as he hasn't changed his address. There we go. Um, and so these projects, he, he works a lot with open pedagogy projects at Oneonta, as well as for various groups and so forth. Um, and so, yeah, here's some of his open pedagogy research. Oops. What is that? Oh, that's what you can search for. So you can click that and then search for key terms in there. Um, but I think we can also get to them through here. Some um, open educational resources, um, authentic assessment. Okay, in any case, I will update this site. I'm kind of embarrassed by this. It's been, it's been a couple, tough couple of weeks. Um, and usually I do an update before I do this. Um, these are all blog posts, but he has links to some of his open pedagogy projects, I'm pretty sure. Um, and any questions or comments? Or thoughts or I think it's amazing that you do this, John, in your huge classes. And well, I, I don't do it in the very large class. I do it in classes generally of 40 to 50. So not in the class of three to four hundred. <laughs> that just wouldn't scale so well. Still. And still. And um, because when I I normally have classes of 25 maybe 30. That's my routine. And, um, and it's hard enough. <laughs> so kudos on that, on that, just keeping the cats herded is a huge thing. And these, because they're messy. I have been doing it in my online introductory class. And during COVID, it worked really well because the students really enjoy, because they record in small groups and they find times that work out. I give them a discussion forum where they, on there, they talk about the topics they're interested in and also what times they'd be available to meet with other people to record. Um, and that's worked pretty well in getting students together. And one of the things they really liked was during COVID, they were so isolated, you know, in that first semester, especially, that they really enjoyed the fact that they got to talk to other students. One downside of that is I asked them to create short podcasts of I think eight to 15 minutes or so, I had one group of students who turned in one that was like 50 minutes. Uh, and it was nice listening to them, getting to know each other and so forth, but they could have been a little bit more concise. So I've, um, I've asked, you know, since then, I've tried to be a little stricter about keeping the time down a bit. Um, but they really appreciated those connections that they had. And they said, you know, this is the first online class that they've had where they actually got to work and talk to other students. And they really appreciated that. This fall when I did it, I had for the first time some complaints about the fact that it was difficult to, you know, to work with other students. And they didn't expect that they'd have to be doing that in an online class because they'd never been exposed to that. So it went from something that they really welcomed to something where a few of them, six or seven students really didn't want to work with other people. And, and partly it was because of schedules, partly some of it was personality and so on. And I did end up with 
a much larger, I've always allowed students to do it on their own if they couldn't find a group that wanted to work on the same topic, but I ended up with far more individual projects this time than I've ever had in the past. And, and that increased the amount of time required, especially since I have them do it in stages where they turn in a draft submission um, and providing feedback on almost twice as many projects this time as you know in pre previous years. So, but, but overall it worked well anyway, and they did appreciate that I let them do it individually, but it was a lot more work for me, so. Okay, um, anything? Any other thoughts or questions or? Okay, well, thanks for joining and have a good rest of the day and stay warm. Thank you, John.